Hey everybody, Mario Dennis here with the Keeping It Real Estate Podcast. I'm my guest today, Mr. David Buckles. David, how are you? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for coming, man. I I really been meaning to spend some time and learn more about what you do and um, who you are and how you got to this point because it seems like I didn't know about you a few months ago, but then suddenly I see you everywhere. What's going on? You know, that's uh, it's funny. You're not the first person to tell me that. And, you know, I have, a, have to give a lot of credit to the Orlando Real Producers Group. Yeah. We got involved with them, gosh, about six, eight months ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of played quietly in the sidelines and, you know, getting my feet wet within the group. You know, I, I come from a real estate background. So moving from real estate to marketing and then going to these big real estate events, you know, with what we do in marketing, we can only do so much with so many people in, in one community. So I kind of sat back, waited my turn, found my fit and found my fit. And that's where everyone started going, oh, David, David, David. And so yeah. we've been having some great conversations. Very good. Um, so tell me a little bit about your company. It's called Bad Marketing, right? Bad Marketing. That's it. Badmarketingiscool.com. That's our yeah. website. And it's actually an acronym. Bad stands for build your brand, attract more customers, dominate your market. Okay. So we kind of derived bad marketing from, it, I was pitching, elevator pitching all the time. We used to be called DB Digital Marketing. It was just self-proclaimed. It was my initials. We were getting our, our feet wet. And my elevator pitch would be, oh, yeah, we help, we help real estate agents build their brand, attract more customers, and dominate their market through highly effective social media strategies, blah, 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 blah right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a second. We got an acronym there, mm -hmm. bad marketing. So that's why we went with bad marketing, but then we figured we'd make a little bit of clickbait, badmarketingiscool.com. And so we raised a lot of eyebrows. A ton of people tell me they'd never do business with me because of the company name. Right. But tons of people tell me they loved the company and loved how edgy it was. Yeah, clickbaiting seems to be a thing now, huh? It really is, yeah. Yeah, it works well. It's funny because it almost seems like no one likes, but I think people don't like it because they get gotten often. So it's yeah. like... I don't like it, but when I figure out a good clickbaity thing, even for the titles of the podcast, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, you guys do mostly um, multi um, social media type marketing? Correct. Yeah, we, we like to stay on the, the platforms that everyone else is on, Facebook and Instagram. It's funny that you may put it in those terms because, you know, a lot of people like to think like it's the stroke of genius of themselves. that That's why they're in those platforms. You're saying we'll follow whatever the masses are. Absolutely. I mean, you think about the numbers, the numbers tell a story and, you know, the screen time, there's statistics coming out on the news about the screen time that we spend on our phone. Um, but not only that, but Facebook and Instagram has a combined almost 3 billion people on it every single day. Yeah. You know, meet the people where they're at. If they're always there, why aren't you branding yourself or your business where they're spending most of their time? Yeah, and it seems like, you know, they're the same company in a way, but, you know, Facebook has been brilliant at being able to monetize their um, their platform and being able to integrate ads for products or for services within the platform. Yeah. Um, so if, if a real estate agent comes to you and they want to enhance their presence online, what's kind of like, what do you do first? Are you looking at their stuff first and seeing where they need the help or you start from scratch? Like, how does that work? So, yeah, depending on what their, like, overall goals or objectives are with their personal brand or maybe they have a team, you know, maybe they're a broker that has, you know, an office with 60, 70 agents or, you know, even if it's a smaller brokerage, something like more boutique, we all start with what's the objective. Do you just want to look good online? Because we can make you look great. You know, I'm sure you've got pictures and content and stories, mm -hmm. but most people just don't know what to do with that. So then we can say, okay, we'll tell you what to do with it. We'll do it for you. We'll help you do it. Whatever you need us to do, we'll do that. Or if you're actively looking to generate new business, there's a difference and people think, oh, well, I, you know what, David, I tried Facebook before and I just don't get any business from it. Well, what was your plan? Wh what were you doing? How were you trying to generate new business? Oh, well, I post about my day and if they need to buy, sell or invest, you know, mm -hmm. I can help. People scroll right past that in their newsfeed. So basically what happens is we just want to find the objective. Do you want to actively lead generate, you know, find people who don't know you and bring them into your business? Or do you want to look good online? And then we start from there. Yeah, it's a, a bit of a difference. It's, it's interesting because in real estate, I feel like when people talk about marketing, they put everything under one umbrella. And your lead generation marketing is a very different thing than your branding. Like, you know, oftentimes they overlap, but 
oftentimes they're not even in the same neighborhood. Yeah, not even in the same ballpark. Right. Yeah. And do you see, so what happens to agents? Because this, this is something that drives me crazy sometimes. Like, do, do they, are they not using social media properly because they have the wrong expectations? Or what do you think it's, it's kind of like the main symptom of why it's not being used effectively by the majority of agents? That's a great question. And oftentimes one of my favorite to answer because people don't want to commit to the time it takes if they don't want to spend the money. And so let me clarify what I mean by that. When I say they don't want to spend the money, Facebook and Instagram, like using social media on a paid advertising platform, like if you want people to see you strategically, you have to spend money with your sponsored ads to get in front of those people. If you don't want to spend money, you have to be creative with your topics and your posts and your pictures and your stories and, and those things, but it's not going to happen overnight. So the number one problem is, is no one's consistent enough with their content but number two, that the expectations, like you mentioned, they, they have a they have an expectation of should I do this now and get a get a client tomorrow? Or I'm gonna do this now and get a client tomorrow, but that's not how the business works. I don't think you've ever talked to somebody today and sold them a house tomorrow. You may have had someone who's ready or willing and able, but at the same time it doesn't happen that fast. So that journey takes a little while longer. The agents need to spend a little bit more time being more creative with their personal business and their brand. Yeah, it seems, and, and I was just talking about this with people in my office last week, that in real estate, you know, we always talk about the ebb and flows of the business. You know, you got a busy time and times that you're less busy. And so what ends up happening is because agents have to switch hats, you know, oftentimes you have an agent that's doing admin and transactions and marketing. When they have the transaction hat, the marketing hat gets put in a box somewhere. Yeah. And that's when they're busy. And then they're not busy anymore and they want to do something to get busy tomorrow and it just doesn't work that way. Like the, the business that you generate today is for the marketing that you did six months ago. That's kind of the rule of thumb, I think. Right, yeah. No, absolutely. I say at, the at rule minimum. of thumb. I think I came up with the rule of thumb just now. but uh, It's I, like 60% like, of statistics yeah. are made up, right? Yeah, it's kind of like that. Yeah, I, I, uh, um, I look at it that way, certainly. Um, and I can certainly track my slower times in business if I go back six months when I'm slow, if I'm slow now and I go back six months and I'm like, oh, that's when I took three weeks off for whatever reason, like when my daughter was born or that's when I did this yeah. or that, you know, so um, that's kind of why I go by that six months rule because that's generally when I can go back and say like, oh, yep, that's where I dropped the ball. Yeah. And then also like most books, most marketing, most branding, anything like that that you'll read online, they all tell you to do it a minimum of 90 days. Like whatever you're going to do, commit to it for a minimum of 90 days because what you start on day one will come to fruition within 90 days at least or at, at hopes within 90 days. But if you can sustain that, exactly right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think one of the challenges with social media has been I know agents that used to do really well before Facebook started, you know, really changing the way the algorithm works and um, the categories and all of that, you know, mm -hmm. because it became non-compliant. Um, but it seems like people used to do well when they would be able to like, before they changed the algorithm. So it, just, it seems like some people got discouraged. Um, I would say probably about a year and a half ago, which is when that started really happening. And they just said like, screw it. It doesn't work anymore. Instead of trying to figure out what, what you have to do now to make it work. Has it become more difficult? Is that, is that what it comes down to or? Well, I wouldn't say difficult. I mean, because we still have the same ability to write whatever we want, essentially. And like, if you're going to be using paid ads, you can still write the same things. You just can't target the same audiences. Right. And what I mean by that is if you're targeting, say, nurses, right, or doctors or medical professionals or things like that. Well, unfortunately, now you can't go into your targeting and target specific, you know, job titles of the doctors, nurses, right. anyone that works in a hospital or the medical field. But you can in your ad copy say, hey, attention, medical professionals, doctors, and then list out the people that you're trying to call attention to because then it says, hey, this ad is, is for you. This post is for you. And so rather than being like, oh, man, you know, beating yourself up, you know, how are we going to do this? Uh, all my targeting, I can't target zip codes anymore. I can't do this. Well, I can't farm this neighborhood specifically anymore. Well, that's okay call out to that neighborhood in that 15 mile radius. Maybe you can call out a, a couple different neighborhoods. Hey, do you live in this neighborhood, that neighborhood or the other neighborhood? Well, if you do guess what, we're the best listing agents in town because you should see our track record in this neighborhood. 
And so you use the ad copy space to actually clarify that, that ideal client for you instead of just the targeting. Yeah, and, and that's the tricky thing, right? Because I don't think a lot of real estate agents like to narrow their audience down. Like agents want to use this gigantic catch net exactly. for customers. And then when you tell them, when you just put in the ad copy like medical professional, then they're really like, well, I mean, I mean, but what if an accountant sees it? I don't want that guy to think like I don't sell houses to from accountant. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think um, agents have a really hard time with that. It's funny because the most effective marketing I've always seen in real estate is when it's concentrated. It's when it's highly specific. But that means you're narrowing the amount of eyeballs. And like most of us are like, ah, do I really want to do that? Like, you know, when there's, do you want to go 50 miles out or do you want to go one mile out? Every agent is like 50, 50. go 50. Yeah, I'll okay. take anyone who wants to buy yeah, a house, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. I don't care if I have to drive two hours, I'm going to sell them that house. Yeah. But how efficient is that? Yeah. How, much, how can you sustain that, you know, and build, build on that? Well, you can't. And it, and it seems like. You know, because if, you know, if you want to spend $200 on a Facebook ad and you make a really wide circle, what ends up happening is you don't have a lot of repetition, you know, like uh, there's not a lot of continuity in a specific space. And so someone may see your ad once and that's it. But like if you do it in a small space, maybe they see the ad, the husband sees the ad, you know, the daughter sees the ad, like the whole family sees the ad and it's just... they talk about it like, yeah, I saw, I saw, you know, and it becomes it, like yeah. this validation thing. Like when they're all sitting there on the couch after dinner watching the, the family show together, yeah. but the commercials pop up. Well, first of all, who watches TV with commercials anymore yeah. between like Hulu and Netflix? But yeah, I don't, ha- I haven't had cable TV. It, it's hilarious because people ask me about the Super Bowl. I'm like, didn't watch it. They're like, what do you mean you didn't watch the Super Bowl? And I'm like, I don't have cable and I have a three year old. So like going somewhere for four hours didn't. Plus, I didn't care about the teams, so it was like, eh. yeah. I mean, the same way. I I didn't get. I didn't have any plans for the Super Bowl until four o'clock that day when I was sitting up at the Crooked Cannon downtown Winter Garden and was like, "Hey, dude, we're having a party. You want to stop by?" Well, sure. What the heck? <laughs> I forgot who was playing in the Super Bowl until I saw you know on the TVs on on at the Crooked Cannon that day. Boy, and I think today, if you asked. In fact, that, that would be a, a fun thing to do, to do like, you know, how G.A. Leno used to do the jaywalking, just walking on the street yeah. asking people questions. It'd be fun to go out and be like, who won the Super Bowl? And they'd be like, uh, the, the Patriots, Patriots, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they'd be like, who was in the halftime? J. Lo and Shakira. Yeah. Because that's been the thing that everybody talks about, right? Exactly. Yeah. Gosh, let's not get on a rabbit trail with that one. It's just, it's fun. Um, I think it's... To me, it's funny because I'm, you know, I'm a troll a heart. I always say like memes are my love language. <laughs> and so to me, it's been, it's, it's funny to see how people think that everything that happens requires a hard thought out opinion. You know, like I got text messages that night. People are like, what do you think about this halftime show? And I'm like, A, I'm not watching the Super Bowl. And I'm like, B, let me look it up. And then I'm like, it was okay. What, like, what? And they're like, but what do you think? And I'm like, I don't. Yeah. Like, I'm thinking about other things. I'm just watching that. But it's not like my mind is not like taking notes like, oh, what's going on here? And what's, yeah. you know, let's like. Let's find something to complain about. Let's find yeah, something like, to have an opinion about. Like I just don't have one. Like, like, I don't have to have an opinion on everything, you know. But people, I mean, that's the power of social media. It gives people a platform to express their opinion. Um, but like, again, in the same way, you should use it smarter, right? right? Like if you're a business owner or an entrepreneur or whatever the case may be, like you have that same ability and power to use it to express what you want to get across and not just troll JLo and Shakira for being older than probably and looking better than most of the people who are probably complaining about it. Well, right? yeah, typically. Right. And th- that's an interesting topic to me because I think that's one that's kind of like it's unsettled in a way in that. For many years, I remember maybe 2012 through 2015, 16, the thing that was told to real estate agents when you went to a conference or, you know, some like large training group where there would be some like self-proclaimed expert on the subject, which, you know, we still don't know what qualified them for that, but, but they were there on the stage and they would, the thing was always kind of like, I mean, if I had to summarize, it was like, be as vanilla as possible. Don't hold strong opinions. Just be super vanilla to make sure you don't alienate anybody. And that was the thing that they would tell everybody to do. Because otherwise, you won't succeed. 
I mean, and regardless of how you feel politically, then comes 2016 and Trump wins by doing the total opposite thing on social media, right. being as polarizing as possible, you know, the most outrageous opinions that you've ever heard. And so that kind of like started a different trend. Like some people now believe that the more opinionated, the more that your base, to call it away, becomes super loyal to you. And I see real estate agents do that. Like I see real estate agents like that they feel like they have to put this like strong opinions the second something happens in the world, like whether it's pop culture or politics or whatever. And I see what they're doing because I see the comments below. Like they're, they're, they're basically rattling their base up a little uh-huh, bit. They're baiting them. Yeah, they're, they're baiting They're creating them. the whole thing, right? Yeah, they are. it's the engagement, right? They're doing the engagement. Yep. W- what do you think about that? Like should people be doing that? Should like... I mean, I think there's what, a balance. What's a good policy? Like, if, if I come to you and I say, David, I don't really post much in social media. What do you think I should do? Yeah, I mean, well, it starts with what, what image do you want? What do you want people to know you as? How do you want people to see you? Do you want to be the one that they scroll past every time because they're like, wow, I do not have time for this today. I am <laughs> not in the mood. <laughs> or do you want to be the person who maybe sparks curiosity a lot? And when I say a lot, I just mean you have various you know, opinions on various topics, but they're not strong one side or the other. They're more conversative, if, if that's a word, conversative. Yeah. They, they spark curiosity enough to get opinions from both sides in a way that doesn't create animosity or a divide. Like, let's have a healthy conversation. If you want to talk about those topics that are going to generate um, some divisiveness, do it tactfully. Yeah. But, like, also, again, use it for letting people inside of, of your mind, use it to express yourself. Like other than just creating controversy all the time, yeah. have some fun, tell some jokes, be funny. Like I love seeing some of the stuff that you post, especially recently with like Zillow and all the eye buyers. And yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I social media's greatest value to me personally, business aside, I think from a business standpoint, the value is you know, you still communicate with your customers and, um, and they're able to kind of take a peek into your life. And, you know, I think people generally love to see other people succeed and people want to root for other people. And, and I love that aspect of social media. But for me, on a personal level, is the humor. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I'm one of those people that I just love comedy. I love humor. And I love it witty. Like, I don't love, like... That's why you say you're a troll at heart, right? Yeah, that's why I'm a troll at heart. Because to me, like, you know, some of the... Uh, when when people come up with like um, a clever meme or a clever joke or like you listen to a stand up comedian they have a really clever bit or yeah. um, or you watch a movie that's really well written or or a show like the shows that I always come back to quotes is always like The Office Seinfeld you know like some of the best shows on TV yeah because right? comedy to me is that that's that's kind of my my heart and so I love that about social media and so what I do generally is like if there is a controversial controversial topic, I'll break it down to make it a joke that both sides can laugh at. Because I think that er- there's a challenge on that, right? Yeah. There's a challenge on doing something that both people can, you know, both s- people that hold opinions on both sides of an issue can laugh at. I think that's a real challenge. So you're though. using humor to be somewhat diplomatic, right? Yeah, and, and listen, I don't think anyone that knows me would describe me as diplomatic. Um, because I hold strong opinions, but not about everything. Yeah. And, you know, my strong, you know, and what is what we were talking about before the podcast in a way, like I hold strong opinions about different issues, but I've learned that Facebook, it's a really bad way sometimes to carry those conversations because Facebook, it's like this thing. First of all, it promotes conflict in, in terms of, you know, what your feed sees. Like the way the algorithm works oftentimes is that, if you, like, for example, if you're anti-abortion, well, you're going to get a, a bunch of opposite articles in front of you because they know that that engages you. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's a system that promotes conflict in a way. And then it's a system that gives people dopamine in the way of likes. And so a lot of times what I notice when people are going back and forth on these arguments, which I used to do a lot, you know, before I kind of realized what was going on. But what I see is like, People are just trying to come up with the best zinger to get likes. Mm-hmm. It's not even about elaborating a point or trying to, elabor- you know, to present your your point. It's about 
you know, getting that dopamine hit, hit when your post goes viral and you got yeah. 500 likes on it and you're like, yeah. Like, why else would people comment on news articles and stuff like that, that you know, with yeah. other people? Like, it doesn't make sense other than you're looking for that dopamine hit when they get the, the viral comment or whatever. Yeah. And, I mean, and to your point, if my brother watches this, I hope he doesn't take this the wrong way. But we were chatting the other day, and he was showing me something on Instagram, and it was a probably a Barstool Sports post or something like that. And it was really funny. And then he left a comment, and the comment was hysterical. And he was like, bro, look, it's been five minutes. I have 200 likes on my comment already. <laughs> and it was just on the comment that he made, not yes. even on the picture or, you know, caption itself. And, you know, to your point, yeah, it's like that that's the validation that people are looking for. But he did it like you. And humor, it was the way to yeah. win. Yeah, it's it, it, it feels like an accomplishment because the, that's that other part, right? Like if you tell a joke to your friends and your friends laugh, they're <laughs> like, okay, cool. You know, they're my friends. They, they know me. Yeah. But if you make a, a you know, five word zinger in a random place and a bunch of random people are hysterical about it, you feel like a, a super accomplished. You're like, look at me. Exactly. You know? I <laughs> went, I'm funny. I knew I was funny. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing. Like I feel like people believe oftentimes in like the more heated debates that people see that I see on Facebook that, the amount of likes determines the winner. I've noticed that. Yeah. Like I've seen people make comments like, there's a reason why there's 72 people to like my comment and only two people to like yours. I'm like, what? That's, that's, that's gonna crazy logic. But yeah, okay. that's, how, that's how we're going to settle arguments now. Like the amount of likes, that seems like crazy. But Keyboard warriors, man. Yeah, and they've been around forever. People think it's new with uh, social media, but message boards were around for a long time. Exactly. Before. Um. Yeah, it's funny. Social media is interesting. Um, where do you think it goes from here? You think it's going to become more um, more friendly for people to use for businesses, like real estate agents to use for businesses, or you think eventually becomes something that um, that sort of like Facebook becomes the gatekeeper of ads and it, it's less friendly to get information across? Well, so they are definitely the gatekeeper. But we're also in uh, what I would call, and other people have called, the gold rush of digital information. We can use Facebook to, you know, or Instagram even, advertising to access more people for cheaper than any other media outlet, you know, presently. You know, think about when the TV first came out. You know, all they were doing was putting out shows, and then they were like, oh, wait, well, let's put some commercials in there and charge businesses to, you know, advertise their brand or product when they did it with the radio. And then Facebook, I mean, it's been online before, but then Facebook started, you know, how, you know, Facebook's origination story, but then now they're just an advertising platform. Yeah. They even call themselves that, Hey, we just sell ad space. That's what we do. What do you, what do you think? Ha you know, to me, that's such an interest. I wish I had a crystal ball that I could see, you know, fast forward in time because I've seen people leave Facebook because of that, because they feel like it's becoming too commercial. Like I'm tired of seeing ads, you know, and they'll go to a different platform but then I think like it chases the platforms it, too. It does. And you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I create the ads that follow you around yeah. the internet everywhere you go. And, yeah. and it's intentional for that, but I mean, you can't run from it. Like you, just like people thought TV was the devil, right? It's the boob tube, you know, it, it's so distracting. You're wasting your life sitting in front of the TV. Well, then we got cell phones and then we got social media on the cell phones that were pulling us away. And so it's going to be ever evolving. And, and if we had a crystal ball, I think we'd all probably run the other direction yeah. based on where things are heading. Yeah. But at the same time, it is what you allow it to be. It is what you make it. Like if you use the platforms properly and you don't just buy into the BS of the media, if you don't buy into people's negative opinions because they just need a place to express their opinion. And that's, that's the other thing. People will use these, these outlets and these platforms as just their diary. Keep that shit in your journal. You know what yeah. I mean? Like if Boy, that's keep great advice. Journal. That's great advice. I, that should be a t-shirt. Facebook is not your diary. Exactly. That's, I mean, that's how I feel. That's my personal opinion about it. But again, it can be utilized in such a way that can, can change lives and change businesses. You can use it to motivate and encourage and inspire and, you know, advertise yourself. And, and especially in the real estate world, real estate is a belly to belly business. People are using Facebook and Instagram in the wrong way that they're annoying their friends and their ideal customers by trying to be something they're not, as opposed to just being themselves, being valuable and being a resource to the people that they know, like, and trust and the people who know, like, and trust them. 
Yeah, that's a that's a that's the reality of it, and it's funny because obviously when you're in the industry, then you have, you know, hundreds of people in your social media that are also in the industry, and then you see that you know sort of like the multiplier factor of it. You know, I always kind of used to laugh. You know, people would go to these classes, and you know, someone would be like, "Okay, what I want everybody to do is pull out your phones and make a post that says, I'm in a contest, and I need." three referrals for people that may be looking to sell their house this year, blah, blah, blah. And so like, and you would open your Facebook because, you know, 30 of my friends happen to be in that class and it'd be like, oh, Jesus, yeah. not again, <laughs> yeah. not again. Here we go. <laughs> and then uh, let me unfollow that person. Let me, let me silence or, or snooze their post for a couple of days, you know? Yeah, what a great feature. That unfollow button, I use that ruthlessly. Like, I don't have any patience for it anymore. Yeah. My mother-in-law was just in town visiting from New Jersey, and she breeds and shows Rhodesian Ridgebacks and, yes. you know, beautiful dogs. And she's a part of, she's like, oh, my gosh, I'm a part of 100 Facebook groups, which if you guys see, you know, Facebook is advertising heavily for Facebook groups now. And because they want people in Facebook, they want you there more. But groups are a great thing. I'm a part of several groups. But back to my point. She's in a hundred different groups, and if she finds an opinion from someone in a group that she doesn't like, she'll hide them, she'll unfollow them, she'll delete them so fast. And hey, it is a great feature, but yeah, it's funny because for um, for the longest time, all the only option that you had was to unfriend people. And so my mom be like, "Yeah, such and such person posted this," and I'm like, "Okay, unfriend them." And she's like, "No, I mean, I it wasn't that. I can't do that, you know." <laughs> and I'm like. So when the unfollow button came around, I'm like, oh, that's smart because now people can unfollow. And, uh, and you're not guilty. You're not guilty of unfriending and you're not creating drama. You're just, you're just not seeing their stuff anymore. Yeah, it's interesting because you, you, it, it, it's funny how it, this took a life outside of social media to where it's like, oh, my God, what is she going to say if she realizes that I unfriended her, you know? And I'm like, I don't know. I think it's kind of silly, but all right, Mom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. It's... But it's the world we live in, you know? Yeah, I think one of the things that has helped me, especially on Instagram, is I'm, I, I'm very careful with my follows and with my likes. And so when I go into the search button now, like that feed is curated so good to the things that I enjoy. So it's yeah. literally like food, cycling, running, and cars. That's no all memes? The, no, there's, there's some memes, but I go to Twitter for the memes because okay. they happen faster in Twitter. Got it. Um, but it's like my feed is curated so good, you know, but then God forbid I like, s you know, I slide and I like somebody's dog. Then like there's all these dogs in there and I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> yes, now you're up. following <laughs> retrievers of Instagram yes, or something yes, like that. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Um, and with Facebook, it's the same. Like, I think, you know, you got to be careful what you're liking and not liking. I used to be a serial liker. I would like everything. Really? You know, everybody's comment. Show support here. You know, show support yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, just don't, you know, just something to do, you, you know. You get a like. You yeah, get yeah, a like. yeah, yeah. I was, they're free, right? So I just yeah. giving them to everybody. And then my feed was a mess. And so when I started becoming a little more cheap with my likes, I think I, my feed got a little bit better, I think. I don't know. What I actually do strategically, if I'm scrolling just kind of aimlessly, and my wife hates when I do this. If we're not doing anything, I'll pop on the couch and, I'll open Facebook for like 10, 15 minutes and just scroll. I want to see what ads are there. I want to see what other, you know, what videos are popping up. And, and I'll be like, okay, this is a, this is an ad for, let's talk about the presidential campaign that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Right. So I liked a presidential campaign ad because I wanted to see how many other presidential right. ad campaigns I could see. And it's, it's astonishing. And that's, I mean, to your point, if you if you like a, a fishing picture, well, good grief, man! You're gonna be getting fishing poles and fishing gear and yes. like all these different things. And so sometimes I'll do it just to see what's going on. Or you know, for real estate, you know, friendly a friendly uh, uh, competitive edge that you can do is if you see another real estate ad that's good, that has some traction, that's notable, like it, comment on it, share it, or do something with it, because then you'll be able to see what what more your competition's doing. Yeah. Because what, again, what you're seeing is it'll come across as sponsored, but if you don't engage with it, Facebook is going to recognize, okay, Mario doesn't like that. Let's not show him anything else like that. Mm -hmm. But if you do like it, okay, he likes stuff like this. Okay, who else is advertising to people like Mario? If Mario likes it, then he might like this too. And so then it's just kind of layers of the more that you express yourself or tell Facebook this is what you're into, they're going to give you as much of it as you want, but then they'll pull it back if you, it's, if you start engaging less with it. 
Yeah, I think that's part of the evolution of social media, right? Like we have this brand new tool. You know, if you look at the human existence, we've had this for three seconds, basically. Right. And we're kind of figuring out how to use it. Um, but to your point, I think what's going to happen, you know, in the future and not very distant is, you know, a class that teaches people how to use, you know, like a high school class on social media. Like, okay, boys and girls, this is what you don't want to do in social media. This is what you want to do in social media. This is how you use it constructively. This is how you don't use it. You know, this is how you use it to your detriment. They should probably start that in like elementary school, middle school nowadays. 100%. It's funny because we talked a little bit about um, Joe Rogan podcast before this. And um, I heard a point being made on his podcast that I never thought of, which is like you go to Twitter and you see somebody's post and whether they're a 12-year-old troll or they are a double PhD Harvard professor, it looks the same, same amount of characters, same font, same everything, you yeah. know? So it's like this real weird thing where, like, it's a world where, like, you really can't, you know, it, everyone looks the same. And it's everyone is not the same. And so that 12-year-old is there and you're taking it seriously and people are engaging back and forth and getting into arguments where you wouldn't do that in the street with a 12-year-old kid. Exactly, exactly. That's so funny you bring that up. Yeah, I, 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 to me it was like a fascinating point, not so much the discrepancy between the professor and, the, and, and a 12-year-old, but it's like, yeah, there's kids on social media you know, with a fake profile picture or, or a profile picture that's not a person at all, and they're just, I would have been that kid. I would have been that kid in there at 12 just, like, starting some shit, you know, yeah. with people. And then you have this grown people, like, going back and forth. It's like, maybe you don't go back and forth with people that you don't know. That should be a good rule of thumb. But at the same time, you, you know, the other side of it is the connectivity aspect of it. If you don't know that the person's 12 and, and you're just trying to engage, whether it's good or bad, you know, at what point, you know, because if it's a 12-year-old girl, like, what? I mean, are you going to have the same conversation with a 12-year-old girl even if it's friendly? Because then now you're just a creep, right? Right. right. And it, there's just so much. And at the same time, there's just so many. Everyone can roast you, right? Everyone can pick apart what you're doing. Someone can find out that the true identity of that and then go to Twitter and be like, oh, can you believe so-and-so was talking this way to a 12-year-old kid? Yeah. It's like, how are we supposed to know it's a 12-year-old child when they're out here dropping F-bombs and talking like a grown person? Yeah. And it, it's just, it's too hard to differentiate. Yeah, anyone that spends one minute of their life ever on an Xbox or PlayStation playing an online game, oh God. They, they'll they quickly realize how ruthless little kids are nowadays. Like, it's so, bad. You know, sometimes I, I'll get on the Xbox and, you know, I have to turn off the headphones. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, I, like this kid sound six, and the things they're saying, they're making me blush. Like, <laughs> I, I'm like, this, what's going on right now? Dude, my brother, uh, he used to live with me for a while, and he's avid in, in playing Xbox when he can. And th exactly to your point, the kind of stuff that, he, that they would say, and one of his favorite responses was like, dang, dude, do you kiss your mom with that dirty mouth? Yeah. And because they are, they're, they're kids. They haven't hit puberty. Kids? Their voice is yeah. cracking, and, and they're talking like adults and sailors, man. It's not oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, well, and it's that, that's the thing that's weird, right? Because there's all this, like, listen, when I was a kid, there was no medium that I could go on and talk that way that I wouldn't have to face some consequences. Yeah. But nowadays... You know, you have the video games and then you have social media. Like kids have so many different ways to be able to talk shit without consequences. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and not just kids, adults do it too. Adults are probably more guilty. I've seen some adults saying some outrageous shit online that I'm like, what are you doing? And then they wonder why their kids or not, maybe not their kids or just kids in general. Well, it's the generation that they look up to setting the example and, I mean, the list could go on and on and on about how we set terrible examples for the next generation, but there's a lot of people who set great examples, yeah. right? And again, we focus on what we want and what we focus on expands. And if the people, which most people do, they, they focus on, oh, well, my opinion, my feeling, my this, my that. Well, I mean, heck, if that's what you're worried about the most, then that's the attention that you're going to generate and create. And sure. So like set better examples, you know, be better if 
if kids are out there talking like that online, it's because they're probably neglected or just following their parents' yeah. footsteps. You yeah, know? for sure. And I don't mean to get on too much of like a, no, a no, deeper no, relational level at that point. but no, that, That's why it's an open conversation because we never know where it goes. Yeah. No. And I mean, that's how I feel. I, I love psychology. Psychology is like one of my favorite topics. And, and it helps in the advertising and marketing world. Because, of course. You know, psychology, we have to get inside the head of our consumers. And so before I was deep into into marketing and advertising, I just enjoyed psychology. I enjoyed understanding why do we think the way that we think? Why do we do what we do? Why do we say that what we say? And then using that in a positive way to you know promote my own business because I know what my ideal clients as real estate agents, I know what you want, I know what you need. I've had my real estate license since 2008. So I was practicing real estate and selling real estate before I started advertising in the real estate industry. And now that's what we do is help real estate professionals across the board. And because I know my ideal client and I know myself and I know their ideal clients, we can use psychology to say, hey, this is how we can help you. This is why you should use us. And it's a really neat game. That's, that's probably a really good thing that you've held your license and that you've sold. Because one of the things that um, irks me a little bit is when people are pitching to real estate agents and they don't. Every business is nuanced and every bi business has specifics, but real estate boy is such a different thing because yeah. you work for a broker, but you really don't work for the broker. You You're hiring yourself. it and, you know, it, there, there's like all this stuff about it that's very different than most other industries. So I, I'm not a fan of people that, that infiltrate the real estate industry and trying to offer a service without having an understanding of the work itself. Yeah, and to your point there, man, when I was just starting out with bad marketing, I was hitting LinkedIn and uh, Facebook, you know, groups and messages and really just trying to reach out and, and offer my services in a, in a more one-on-one -on -one professional way. And you would be shocked at the responses that people would give me. Oh, screw you. Can't, just another one of those Facebook foo-roos, you know. Well, when Facebook ads came out, there were so many Facebook ads about teaching you how to run Facebook ads that everyone started a Facebook ad agency. And then the, the low-hanging fruit, you know, everyone went for low-hanging fruit. And, hey, real estate lead gen's easy. You know, housing market's, you know, booming again here in the last three, four, five years. And so they were easy targets. Realtors were easy targets. And for, for gosh, what has it been, four or five years, you're seeing the same, oh, get this free hot market buyers list or get this home evaluation. Well, that stuff does not work. It worked when, when the Facebook ads first came out, but it, it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was just having coffee today with someone who they were asking me more about how we can help them with, with their social media. And the first question they asked me was, how much experience do you have in real estate? I was like, well, actually, I've been licensed since 2008. And the whole dynamic of the conversation changed because well, of course. they didn't realize that I was that well-versed and, and diversified in, in real estate. Yeah, because, you know, um, to give the benefit of the doubt to agents... I get a dozen phone calls and emails. Like every single day, I will get at least a dozen f between emails and phone calls, one, uh, 12, 15, every single day of someone pitching me something. And so a couple of things that I think agents don't appreciate is the sneaky thing. You know, like I have, I just had one today that the guy is like, and they're getting sneakier, by the way, in the call centers, because normally you could pick up when someone is in a call center but the, I don't know what kind of equipment they're using now that it really does not sound like a call center. And this guy's like, hey, is this Mario? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, my name is such and such. And um, before we go any further, have you worked with veterans before? And I'm like, yeah, of course, all the time. You know, and he's like, great, because uh, I'm looking for an agent that works with veterans. And I'm like, yeah, you know, we've done this, that. And so I kind of like, I think this is someone that's kind of, um, soliciting me for business and they're trying to find out more about my experience like and working. Like if you're going to be a good fit for them. Correct. And so I go on this and it's like, great, because I represent this new, this uh, ad agency that has ads in, in veteran clinics and, and I'm like, my dude. <laughs> do you hang up or do you, do you finish the conversation? Oftentimes I'll finish, oftentimes I'll hang up. Yeah. Today I didn't have much time, I hung up. And and I don't want to be rude. And I know, you know, like, I know my weaknesses very well. I'm, I'm pretty self-aware. So I'm like, I knew, like, I saw a red line, you know. Yeah. <laughs> when I know that he got me, I'm God like, dang it. I yeah. saw a red line. I'm like, let's get off this call before I say something yeah. that it's going to hurt someone, you know. And it's like, they've got a job to do too. So at what point do you just, like, let them sure. do their job? And 
but then again, they're getting too sneaky. You know, we call it creative. Yeah. Creative. But truth is, is yeah, they're getting sneaky. They're, you know, they're skip tracing us, you know, they're finding our information and they're putting us in dialers. And yeah, I mean, they've got the, just like the technology we're using here mm-hmm. when they're using headsets and microphones that have like the gain sensitivity up mm-hmm. and down and like, you're not going to hear anything else unless someone's speaking directly into their microphone. Right. Which is why they don't sound like they're in a call center anymore. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's why agents are so um, allergic to folks like that do what you do. Yeah. Because the initial reaction is like, ah, shit, I got three of these calls this morning, you know. Which is exactly why I moved to paid advertising. Yeah. Because there is such a stigma around it. And listen, I hate being harassed just as much as the next guy. Of course. So how do you how do you get those people to come to you was the question that I started, you know, asking myself. How do they come to me rather than how do I go annoy them or or bother them or create, you know, how do I get myself blocked? You know, I don't want to get myself blocked on any of these platforms. And I started using humor in my ads. I was using ads to just kind of be funny and you know, people pay for ads and they're glued to their phone. And I, I think one line that one of my best performing ads ever was, you know, are you tired of being glued to your phone like macaroni noodles on a kindergarten's plate, right? You know, when they, you, your daughter comes home from preschool and all that stuff's, you know, glued yeah. to the plate. And, you know, that was a good one. And uh, what was it? Prince, uh, who's the old guy? The old the old guy, Prince, ha- Prince Charles. Charles. Yeah. I had an ad image of him chasing the little is like a little girl in like the yellow raincoat. She's yeah. holding the baton. Or yes, yes, you know yes, 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 of course. So I had him, I had an ad image of him chasing that little girl. And I said, are you tired of chasing down leads? Right? Yeah. Are you tired of chasing your internet leads? And that got so much traction because you have to connect with people, man. Like so many people are tired of being sold. Give them a good laugh. It was like a humor works. It works. Just like when you go to the bar, like before we were all married, you know, and you're going to pick up a chick, like, I always said, if you can make them laugh, you're in. Yeah. So I use the same approach in my advertising. If we can make them laugh and like get their guard down for a second, they'll probably read the rest of my ad, click through it, and at least give me a shot. Right. Yeah. That's 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 important. That's how, and I I've, I've said that about real estate agents for a long time. You know that when we engage in activities that perpetuate the negative stereotypes of our industry, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And, you know, some of the negative stereotypes in our industries, you know, this 50 phone calls. And, and listen, I get it. There's people that do the dialing for dollars and it works well and they've built great businesses and they run a big business based on calling people 70 times a day. And that's fine if it works for them. But to me, whether it works or, or it doesn't, the bottom line is, is it perpetuates a negative stereotype of the industry, which is we are... You know, we're just waiting for you to like for that listing agreement to expire to jump on top of you. You know, yeah. we, and so I, I've I've always had the same approach that you have. Like, you know, my call to actions are firm, but I don't put them in front of people unless they've requested information from me. So it's generally like, you know, I'll do an ad or I'll do a you know magazine print copy or something. But someone picked that up and then saw me in it, or someone you know was watching was searching for something that made my ad come up. Um, yeah. So it's not like, it's not like I'm showing up at their door uninvited, you know, like door knocking. Exactly. I'm like that to me, door knocking is one of the, like, I can't imagine going around do- knocking on people's doors. Like I literally have a sign on my door that says, don't knock on this door. Really? Yeah. No, not no soliciting. Just don't knock on my door. If you're well, trying to sell a, something. it says something like, um, baby might be sleeping. If you knock on the door, the dog is going to bark and the baby's going to wake up and I'm going to be pissed off. <laughs> Something along those <laughs> lines. Good. I'm paraphrasing. F- found it in Amazon. And it's funny because you see people sometimes that are door knocking for services and um, they'll go and they go pressing the doorbell and they're, they're, they read and they're like, and they, uh, <laughs> and they back away, run away, away before you get there. Yeah. <laughs> but the ring doorbell gave them away. Huh? Yeah. They, but they don't press it. They, they go like, and then they see it because it's right off. Like you literally have to move the sign to be able to press the doorbell. Oh, see, that's smart. So you can't tell me you didn't read it. So you see them go and they they read and they're like, mm, and then they go away, you know. So man, that's funny. Yeah, I I I don't like doing those things. I don't like I don't like uninviting myself to people. I don't know. It's I'm, I'm I don't find that very productive for me. Yeah, it's it's challenging. Yeah, it's a challenging conversation. It's a challenging topic. 
Yeah, especially in an industry that has done that for so long. But the people are sticking in those old ways. Right? You don't have to dial for dollars anymore. You don't have to knock on doors anymore. Be a digital door knocker. Yeah. Find someone who, you know. Be a digital door knocker. That's another shirt. We're coming up with shirts Man, left and right. Man, are we here. writing this stuff down? <laughs> well, we're, we're recording, recording it. it. That so. counts, right? <laughs> um, but, yeah, digital door knocking, right? And that's something that I, I would tell some of my clients to do. Like, when we're creating content and putting it on Facebook or Instagram and people are engaging, well, rather than just saying thanks or, like, liking their comment on, on your post or whatever, have a conversation. And if, if the conversation, it's kind of like group messages. Like if you're mm-hmm. in a group message and then just two people are cop- talking back and forth, you're like, guys, go start your own group yeah. chat, right? Like, why am I here? Yeah, like, come on, man. But the same way, take that conversation from the actual post and take it in Messenger. Take it to Facebook Messenger, Instagram Messenger. And that's what I call digital door knocking. Like slide into those DMs, but do it strategically and like yeah. have a meaningful conversation because you're actually connecting. Again, real yeah. estate's belly to belly. Even though it has nothing to do with real estate, but you happen to be, you know, a real estate professional. Well, the more human that you are and the more that people can just really connect with you as an individual, that's what's going to earn their trust in business with you. They're going to be you're going to be the only one that they think of because you're funny. You have meaningful conversations. you you know, your your memes are good. Your humor is great. And then, oh, by the way, he just happens to sell real estate. Oh, and I need to buy or sell or invest. You just want to be the go to person. And don't always be selling, you know, don't always be selling. That's another 80, 20 rule. Use it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's the other thing, right? Like sometimes every like like agents like to go always to that well of, Hey, you know, anybody looking to buy, sell or invest? Yep. And that's like the tagline, right? Hey, I'm a real estate professional. I'm a real estate agent. Do you know anyone? And then just, and I think people's ears shut off at that point or, the thumb scroll gets a little bit faster when <laughs> when they see yeah, that like pop up. Ah! <laughs> yeah, again, not, not again. Gosh, close my eyes or, and everything. Yeah, it, it, and, you know, one thing that I've noticed in times past, you know, previous places that I worked on or whatever, that you would see the engagement on your post. And you can start seeing the engagement decline over time. And then you look at a post from today and one from a year ago. And now with memories, it's really easy to see that. Mm-hmm. And if you're seeing your engagement decline, when there's probably a bunch of people that are unfollowing you. And so back to the unfollow button, before the measure used to be, well, if you had followers, you had people looking at your stuff. But now you can have followers that are all unfollowing you and no one's looking at your stuff. Yeah, I mean, I have 1,400 or something friends on Facebook. I see the same 18 people every yeah, day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, you probably curated your feed to that. Yeah, I was tired of reading people's journal entries, you know, I was tired of seeing the same cat and, you know, or dog or this meme. But I tell you what, like you said, the memes are getting great, man. The memes are getting good. So yeah, memes are, it's a currency, man. That's a whole nother language. Yeah. You know, like I've seen memes about memes that say like, if, if you don't share memes, are you even really friends? Yes. Like you don't even have to, you don't even have to have a comment about the meme. Just send it. 100%. Listen, I have not just one, but several groups of friends that were in group text that all it is is meme sharing. <laughs> one might be a group text of my friends that are into sports and all we do is like, sh- and this is not like we sat down and we're like, okay, guys, what we're going to do in this group text. No, no, it just, it just happened. It just organically became the group text for sport memes. And the other one would be like the group text for like the inappropriate memes and the group text for the real estate memes. Yeah. Um, I find it hilarious. It's too good, man. It's way too good. And the thing is, it's always a numbers game. You know, like you see 10 and they're like, "Eh," and then you see one that just like makes your belly ache. You know, (laughs) you're like, oh, man, that's so good. Um, So, I, yeah, I love that. Yeah, memes are, they are. They're just a whole nother language. As a matter of fact. Memes are so good. I don't mean to cut you off, but memes are so good that I've done. It's funny because I don't do them too much in my business. I don't do them at all on my business page anymore, but I'll do them like on the podcast page. But I've seen in the past where people do a meme on their business page and other real estate agents are sharing, hitting the share button, which means you're sharing your competition to your friends, which is kind of like, eh, but it is your competition. But it's like memes elicit like this desire of your people to laugh at it that people are so compelled to hit that share button. Yeah, because when you find a good one, man, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, I found it from him. But isn't that thing funny? 
they get to share in a little bit of the like the credit from sharing the meme itself. Yes, yes. It happens when you're having a conversation with people. You'll be having, you know, you'll be at a bar or you'll be at a restaurant. And it'll be you'll be having a lunch. It's like, oh man, that remind me of this meme. Did you see the meme? And you'll be like. No, I didn't see the meme on the phones come and out. And next like thing you know, <laughs> yep. like the freaking cat meme with yeah. the, the lady yelling and the yes. cat. Like, if you didn't know what that meme was, then you were living under a rock, right? D- yeah. Well, that meme, it's hilarious because that meme, um, our nanny, our she got us for Christmas, like, these two coffee cups. And one of them is, like, the two ladies and my face and my wife's face is photoshopped in it. And the cat is my daughter's face photoshopped in it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like... We have meme coffee mugs now. I've never heard of that. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, it's that w- pretty clever. Yeah. Pretty clever. Memes yeah. are so powerful. I've actually been targeted on Instagram for, believe it or not, there's a guy selling how to use memes to resurrect like follow-up. So communicating with prospects via follow-up using memes. Well, I can see that 100%. Um, you know who Renee de Resta is? I th- I'm not off the top of my head. She is. She's not famous, but she's. Um, she was in a few different podcasts, and she researched um, what the Russian Internet Research Agency was doing for the 2016 election. So, she was the lead. The lead on the research team that was figuring out how the this Russian troll farms were infiltrating into the United States. And so one of the things that they were doing that was most effective is this Russian troll farms, which is literally people people have a hard time picturing this. Imagine, you know, a giant office building, 25,000, 30,000 square feet with cubicles with five, 600 employees on it. All they're doing is memes and curating Facebook pages and Instagram pages. And so... Really? Yeah, so that's... When they say that um, that the Russians um, interact or affected the 2016 election, this is how they did it. They never hacked a voting machine. And what they did is, for years, by the way, they started this like in 2011. They would start all these Facebook pages. Like, for example, um, um, people who love hot rods, you know, Facebook page and, you know, pictures of hot rods. Yep. And they worked in years to build the audience of that page. So like data mining, essentially. Right. right. And then occasionally, on during the election, they would drop a political meme in it that'd be like, not self, re- like, just for example, it would be like, no self-respecting hot rod owner would ever bo- vote for Hillary Clinton, boom, and put it there. And so the people that are following the page who are real people, they're like, they cl- they're like, oh. So yeah, they, they got I can't it. identify with that. Yeah, and so there was another famous one, which was um, they this Russian troll farm had a page of um, that that dedicated to like hairstyles for African American women, and so for years they curated curated the page and shared pictures and how to videos and all of that, and during the election they would like send out a meme. No self-respecting African American woman would vote for this person or the or the other person, and so wow. and so then they would create this other. Th- they, they took it a step farther. They would create pages. One would be like um, a Texas separatist page. You know, the people that want Texas to be its own country, and then be like a Black Lives Matter or um, you know some other like perhaps a, some other group that has. Um, a view that's totally different than that group. And they would actually organize rallies from Russia in that page. So it'd be like, hey, we're all meeting at, you know, at the Capitol, wow. blah, blah, blah. And then the other page, they would organize a rally at the same exact time in the same exact place to create conflict. So you had all these Texan separatists and all this, you know, called, I, I don't know if it was Black Lives Matter or like, some other group that that would not get along with these guys basically yeah. meet at the same time. And there's no like organizer showing up. It's just all these people showing up to this rally that this page put together because with events you can do that. Yeah. And then shit hits the fan. Psychological warfare. And so I that mean. so that's what they were doing. And the biggest way that they were using to infiltrate into people's feed was was with memes. They would create all these memes and they would get shared a thousand times. And Rene Duresta, who talks about this at length, says 
Some of the memes were hilarious. Some of them were kind of silly because you could tell it was like a Russian that didn't speak very good English yeah. writing it. So it was like, ah, you missed. <laughs> but some of them were really good. They went as far as some of these people that were creating these memes that would come to the United States and spend four months driving through the United States just to learn about the country, interact with people. Um, and so they did this for years leading up to the 2016 election. And then they used all this, this troll farm to infiltrate into people's feed. And the estimation from... Um, from the the department, this was a uh, this was an investigation that was done for a Congress. They concluded that 84 percent of all people in Facebook shared something from a fake Russian troll farm. That's interesting. 84 percent of people. Now, who uh, funded this troll farm? Was the 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 I government? Think was, I think it was government funded. Yeah, it was government funded. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, you know, but it's funny because we think about things to political or really high level like oh they're hacking in this like very inconspicuous ways and trying to get behind your computer you know no they're making funny memes and they know that shit's gonna get shared like a wildfire you know if and so and the other thing that they would do by the way which was even more interesting to me was they would create these followings you know they had you know pages of horrors or whatever sports teams or uh artist fan pages or whatever and they would have 10,000 followers. And then they would let them go dormant for a little about bit, for a little while. And then they would flip them to something really controversial, like a really controversial topic. They would flip all of the marketing and everything on the page. So what would, ha- what would happen is that was a way for them to like show that there was a lot of people following this particular hateful ideology, whatever that might be. And the other way, the other thing that they would do is like, they had so many pages that they would create about different things that if one didn't work, so like they would try to build an audience. Mm -hmm. And so let's say they got stuck at 1500 people and they really didn't gain any more followers. They would repurpose that page into something different to see if they could, you know, get it going. And so they would try that two and three and four times. And so when you would look back on the feeds of those pages, you know, for four years ago, four years ago, it was a page about fashion. And then bef- after that, it became a page about the Miami Dolphins. And then after that, it became a page about, you know, trucks. And you can, d- another thing with Facebook, you can now see something that's called page transparency. Mm-hmm. So if you're familiar with page transparency. I'm not. So uh, just like high level overview real quick. Like if you go to, again, go to your competition, go to one of these pages, go just go to any of these group pages or anything like that. And just kind of scroll down to the middle, you know, right side of the page, and you'll see a new thing there, and it's called page transparency. So you click on that page transparency, and you can see all the previous names that that page had. Not only that, you can see what type of ads they're running, if they're running any at all. So when you go to page transparency, you can see the, you know, almost attitude of the page based on, like, their congruency with what they started with um, and basically their consistency with their message. So you can kind of use that button to get the, the inside. That's scoop. funny because I'm sure these things are related. Yeah. What I'm telling you, what you're telling me, I'm sure these things are related. I'm sure there's, that's the reason for it. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. This, I mean, there's no other reason based on what you're hearing. I've, I've heard of it, but I'd never heard of it in depth like you were sharing. And now yeah. just all these different, you know, things are just clicking. All the dots are connecting in yeah, my head right now. Yeah. So again, her name is Renee DeResta. And so if you follow her or you Google her, there'll be like, a billion videos, if you're interested in the subject, a billion videos and podcasts and things that she's participated on. I'm um, definitely going to have to look into that. That, that were incredibly eye-opening. Um, David, we just did an hour here, man. It was an hour already? Yeah, already an hour. Time Dang, flies man. in here. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for coming, David. We'll do this again for sure. Um, can you tell people how to get to your website and all that good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, badmarketingiscool.com. You can find us there. You can find me on Instagram uh, at David Buckles. You'll be able to connect with me there. Again, we help real estate agents, real estate professionals build their brand, attract more customers, and dominate their market all through highly effective social media strategies. So we look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.